Okay, well, we're just after seven, so we'll get started and greetings and welcome. And this is going to be the first of our three part series on Caribou in Alaska. I'm Heather Jameson. I'm a wildlife education and outreach specialist for Fish and Game in Northwest Alaska for Region 5. And um, first off, I want to thank you for taking your time. And we're very excited to have this opportunity uh, for you guys to join us um, from, virtually from across the state, our country, and uh, around the world. So as a reminder for our presentation tonight, the audio is set to off and the video is set to off. Um, we will be recording this and we'll have it available on our YouTube and Vimeo channels afterwards so people could share it or use it as classroom resources with their students. And um, if you do have questions throughout the presentation, feel free to put it in the chat box. We'll keep an eye on that. And then we'll also have an open um, question answer session at the end of Lincoln's presentation. So without further ado, I'd like to have you guys join me in welcoming our speaker tonight. Our speaker will be Lincoln Perrette. He's the Alaska Department of Fish and Game Wildlife Research Coordinator for Region 5 in Northwest Alaska. And he grew up on the North Slope living in Katovic, Akasuk, and Yukiavik. And he has worked for Caribou or with Caribou for over 20 years. And he currently coordinates and supervises all of the fish and game uh, wildlife research and activities that take, takes place throughout Northwest Alaska. So Lincoln, if you're on the line, we'll pass over the mic and thank you guys for joining us all today. Okay, thank you, Heather, can you hear me? We can. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so uh, this is just meant to be kind of an overview, just, uh, you know, what makes a caribou a caribou? Uh, the beginning of this multi-part series, um, there's gonna be some additional talks that are about specific things, uh, about health, about how we count caribou, maybe some specific uh, presentations about specific herds, but this is just gonna be kind of a general overview and, and really my perspective on what makes a caribou a caribou. So this picture here is a collared Teshikpuk caribou. Uh, the photograph was taken by Jim Dow, um, who thought he was uh, looking at Western Arctic caribou, but lo and behold here, this caribou came and he could tell from the collar that it was actually a Teshikpuk caribou and sent this picture to me. Um, 0903, that's who that caribou is. Um, that is the subspecies of caribou, Rangifer tarandus granti, which is basically all the caribou in Alaska um, are that subspecies. Um, let me see if I can advance, there we go. So a little bit about my background, and I'm gonna give you this background because when I talk about what makes a caribou a caribou, it really is gonna be my perspective. Um, as Heather said, I grew up on the North Slope. Uh, so I work with caribou professionally for over 20 years, but um, informally before that for a long time. Uh, I've mostly worked with the big herd. So that means like over 10,000 in my perspective. Um, the smaller herds like the Delta herd, the Macomb, some of these interior herds, some of uh, the South Central herds, I know quite a bit less about them. Um, among the big herds, my expertise certainly would lie within the Arctic herds, um, all those caribou that calve on the North Slope. And the caribou that I've worked with the most and currently work with are the Western Arctic and Teshikpuk herds. And so we'll look at some maps that kind of show where all those are. Right now, there's about 31 herds recognized in Alaska. Um, the numbers here are a little bit out of date, but they range from just a few hundred in some of these cases um, to over 200,000 in uh, the case of the porcupine herd over here and the Western Arctic herd over here. These four are the four Arctic herds that calve on the North Slope. Um, and then there are small herds all over the place. There's a fairly large one here, the 40 mile, another fairly large one, the Melchina, and another fairly large one here, um, used to be fairly large, the Mulchatna. Uh, Pretty much everywhere in Alaska where we have that tundra boreal interface, uh, we have caribou right now. Um, not everywhere in Alaska, as you can see, but, but most places where it isn't just uh, pure mountains or pure boreal forest. This is kind of a joke, um, but a thing people used to say a lot of times, uh, 
was they would start a meeting and say, this year marks the umpteenth, the 39th consecutive year of unusual caribou movements. And I've heard the quote attributed to Jack Whitman. I've heard it attributed to Jim Dow. But the idea really was that um, these caribou were confusing. And I got to spend uh, last weekend in Unalakleet with uh, a former caribou biologist, Pat Valkenberg. And we talked a lot about the early years. Um, right after statehood and in the 70s when he was working, um, caribou were confusing. They were really, really confusing for people. Um, they seemed to be here today, gone tomorrow. They didn't know whether they just moved. Um, did the population decrease? Do they mix? Does one herd become another herd? What is a herd? Um, people really struggled. Uh, they were very confusing. Um, Patrick was telling me that some of the early wildlife managers just would throw their hands up. They just didn't know what to do. Um, the whole idea of what a caribou was, was befuddling to them. And since then, um, I think there's two things that we've, we've really learned uh, and kind of describe caribou in, in, from my perspective, again, as sort of a large herd person. Uh, these two iconic features uh, of caribou, the things that I think people think about a lot when they think about caribou is that they move a lot. They're these just migrants. They're constantly on the move. Um, again, here today, gone tomorrow. Unpredictable. Are they going to be here? Or are they going to be somewhere else? And then the populations, the abundance can be pretty unpredictable too. Um, rapid, rapid changes in abundance over time. And so those things remain to this day. Uh, Maybe we understand them a little bit better, but they remain really iconic features of what it is means to be a caribou. So uh, here's a quote I remember from graduate school. I mostly remember it because I had to look up all the words in it. Um, caribou are the most vagile, non-volant terrestrial mammal. Um, I also remember it because it seemed a little pretentious to me, but uh, those are some fancy words to basically say that um, if, if you exclude fish and you exclude birds and you exclude whales, um, because we're terrestrial only, and we exclude animals that don't fly, that's the non-volant part. Um, so no bats, no whales, no fish, uh, no birds. If you exclude all those, which is getting rid of a lot of animals, um, caribou are the most mobile. That's what the vagile part means. They're very mobile animals and um, among all the different terrestrial mammals, uh, they're kind of head and shoulders above all the rest. So this graph is the movement rates, the hourly movement rates in kilometers per hour for the Teshikpuk herd. And it's not, you know, known to be a big moving herd. There are certainly individuals that go a long, long way, but lots of members of this herd don't necessarily migrate in any given year. So they're not a big mover among caribou. Um, but here we are on January 1st, and it's basically the same through the course of the winter. They're going along at almost two kilometers an hour. Uh, that doesn't sound like much, but if that's what you're averaging over the course of every single day, so 0.2 times 24, they're gonna cover some ground. They're gonna go kilometers a day. Now, that's at the slow period during the middle of winter when it's dark and there's not much food around. So here comes one of the iconic parts. We're coming to spring migration and we're moving along. Again, this is a herd that has some members that migrate, some that don't, so some of them might not be moving that fast. Uh, we're gonna drop down a little bit for calving. Um, this is a notable, notable feature of their biology. They slow down because those calves can't move that fast, but here we are just a few weeks later, coming into July, the end of June and July, and those rates are climbing and climbing and climbing. And this is an interesting feature about most caribou herds. You think of them as being the big movers during migration, but some of their highest movement rates are actually in the summer. Um, they're getting away from bugs at that time, trying to flee, get to uh, windier spots, get to cooler spots, whether that be on the top of a mountain or, or maybe on the coast or in a snow field or along a glacier. They're trying to get away from those bugs. And as those bugs recede during the course of the summer, we slow down and they're starting to eat. This is eating time. They are spending a lot of time traveling across the landscape and eating. And then here comes fall migration, another big peak, and then they're gonna slow down as they enter the winter and enter that phase where they're really only moving maybe a kilometer, kilometer and a half a day or an hour, which is again, still a lot. But that's sort of the fundamental thing that I think about. Caribou are always moving and that 
is enabled by certain things and also driven by certain things. And we'll talk about some of those. Uh, physiological adaptations for movement. Uh, caribou have long legs, and especially if you compare them to their domestic counterpart, reindeer, um, they have particularly long legs. Their hooves are kind of cool. Um, if you've ever walked around on spongy tundra or in the mud or soft gravel, um, you know how you're walking along and your energy just goes into the ground and you don't get it back. Um, well, that's because we kind of have peg legs compared to a caribou. They've got four legs, four feet, big wide hooves, and they don't really sink into the ground. So they're kind of retaining some of that energy. They have a huge heart. And I don't know, think that means they're kind necessarily. I think it just means they have a lot of blood flowing through their body and it lets them uh, cardiovascularly just keep on the move all the time. Um, their joints are pretty cool. Uh, the way that their joints work, they actually pick themselves up as they're moving along. So they kind of save a little bit of energy as the way, the way their, eggs, their legs rotate through each step. So they're picking up a leg, it's uh, returning through um, the joint action, and then, um, then they're actually physically moving it forward with their muscles. They're a concentrate feeder. And what that means is that they're kind of high graders. They always want the best stuff. Uh, the most nutritious, the things that are just sprouting. They're not very interested in eating a bunch of dead, uh, woody vegetation, but there's a cost to that. You know, if you're gonna eat the best food, that means you have to be constantly in search for that food. And so there's sort of a circularity that goes on there. Um, being able to move a lot means you can eat the best food and eating the best food means you have to keep moving because you ate it, especially if you're hanging out with 200,000 of your closest friends. They have precocious young. So that was uh, when we looked at the movement rates coming out of calving, the way that they can launch right into those high movement rates again is because those calves, soon after they're born, within about 48 hours, um, can pretty much outrun a human. Uh, takes them a little while longer to be competitive with maybe a wolf or a bear, but uh, they can move and they can keep up with their uh, mother pretty darn quickly. All these things add up for care. We have very low energetic cost of movement. It just doesn't cost them a lot compared to other animals to move. And so that means that they can move about the landscape and exploit it basically. Find the best things, get away from the worst things. And it's a fundamental feature of what makes them what they are. So some consequences from a biologist's perspective. Uh, initially, they were really hard to study. Um, they were hard to find. We didn't, we couldn't find them. Um, where were they on the landscape? Again, here today, gone tomorrow. Another thing, when you are moving at your slowest at, uh, you know, two-tenths of a kilometer an hour, you're not spending a lot of time in any one place. Uh, so when we want, as biologists, to relate that animal to its landscape, its landscape is changing constantly. And so, especially before we had things like remote sensing and satellites, we were really at a loss sometimes to relate caribou to the landscape that they were living in. And then the other thing that was happening is that change was happening fast. Uh, these populations would change rapidly. People didn't really understand why. They weren't even sure if the population had changed or if they'd just gone somewhere else. Maybe they joined a different herd. Um, it was really, really confusing. And so an advent came along to Alaska that really helped people, uh, airplanes. And they could go out in the landscape, cover lots of ground, and they began to learn a lot about caribou. Um, airplanes were really helpful, but what was really a, a game changer from my perspective is the advent of radio collars. So what we have here on the screen, um, the orange ones are just DHF collars, very high frequency collars. And what's inside this little box is a miniature radio station. And it just beeps, beep, beep, beep. And if you wanna get a fancier caller, it'll beep a little faster if they're dead, if it stops moving. But it's just a beep, you need an airplane to go and find it. Um, and for many years, it was a huge boon to us. We could put these out and then we could get in our airplanes um, in all but the coldest, darkest months and the worst weather, and we could go find these caribou. And we began to learn a lot. Um, some of those early biologists, uh, Jim Dow, Patrick Falkenberg, uh, many others, they began to learn a lot about caribou distribution and movements and began to understand more about what made a population a population. On the left side here are GPS callers. And so they have Similar technology in this box. They also have a VHF component, and they've also got an antenna on top that allows it to collect a GPS signal, 
and then send that signal back up to a satellite, which comes back down to the earth and can be accessed by biologists in their offices. And so this is another huge game changer for us. We didn't even need to fly anymore. Um, we could keep track of those caribou again in the darkest of months, uh, in the worst of weather. You still need an airplane, and, and this also has a VHF component, and you still need an airplane every time you want to look at the animal. And there are definitely times and places that we want to do that, look at the caribou. Uh, here's another kind of collar that's sort of a specialty uh, for us once in a while. Um, it's an expandable collar. It has these pleats here, um, and the fabric in these pleats pops pretty easily, and that collar expands. And basically, this last set of pleats will pop when it gets to be about a year old. And so here's uh, a 24, 36 hour uh, old calf carrying a brand new collar. So, how do we put these things out? So, here's uh, Christy Osborne. She's uh, the new Kotzebue area biologist, and she's catching a newborn calf. And the way that we generally do that is we drop them off close to the calf with a helicopter, and then you just run it down. Um, you chase that calf down and then uh, handle it for a few seconds, put the collar on, um, let it go. You're trying to do this all within a matter of seconds, 15, 20, 30 seconds, so that the mother doesn't lose interest and uh, they get back together. And these are um, particularly for studies where we're very interested in when, where, and why calves are dying, because calves obviously are a tasty little scrumptious uh, snack for lots of different animals out there. And so, um, why and when and where they die is sometimes of particular interest to us. A lot of animals, and especially on the North Slope, uh, are net gunned. Uh, so here's Jason Sikoski shooting a net out at a young bull caribou. Uh, all across the North Slope, this is um, primarily the way that we're catching caribou these days. And in other parts of Alaska, um, a lot of times what they're doing is a combination of drugs that allow that caribou to kind of become a little bit senseless and relaxed, and then you can approach it. And uh, here's Bob Jang and, uh, uh, out of the toke office, and then Rick Swisher, uh, an amazing helicopter pilot, uh, working up a 40-mile caribou. And so those are the, the primary ways in a lot of Alaska that we're catching caribou. Here's one more. Um, this is uh, a, a Western Arctic caribou crossing the Kobuk River. Um, in the 70s, uh, late 70s and early 80s, uh, folks realized that uh, caribou were fairly regularly crossing at a location on the Kobuk River. Coincidentally, it's a place where um, people have been hunting caribou for thousands and thousands of years. Um, but we realized we could catch caribou there. Um, it's a pretty unique situation, but it's really nice. Uh, it's fairly low stress for the animals. Um, here I am holding the head. Uh, Jim Dow is about to draw some blood. Um, he's on the right there. And then here's two kids um, from local schools. And another really neat thing about this project is we've been able to incorporate uh, local school kids for years and years and years. Um, in recent years, this project's been a little bit difficult to accomplish because the migration has become very unpredictable. And on a lot of years, they're not very few animals are actually crossing the Kobuk. And so we're having to revert to more of the net gunning approach in, in this case. But that's a really cool project that uh, I was privileged to be part of for a long time. And so those are the main ways that we're catching caribou in Alaska. Just a few of the uses for those collars, of course. Um, again, we were very interested to track distribution and movements. Where are these things going? What are they doing? Where are they at different times of the year? These collars are critical for estimating abundance. As I mentioned uh, early on after statehood, uh, lots of confusion about caribou abundance and whether populations were increasing, decreasing, were they mixing? And so the collars really helped us understand uh, what constituted a population and how many there were. And we'll speak briefly about that for a second, but there's gonna be a whole separate presentation about that um, by Tom Seaton and Nate Pampern. We also use them to distribute sampling effort. And so what I mean by that is if you wanna go out, for example, and figure out what the population's composed of, how many bulls, how many cows, how many calves, we'll use those collars to distribute our efforts spatially. Um, we can use it also for things like understanding how many calves are making it to 10 months old. So they're about to be recruited into the adult population. So we use it to distribute our effort there. And of course, we use it to monitor births and deaths. So we can take that collar, we can radio track it at the right time of year, and we can detect whether or not that 
calf is pregnant and whether or not she's had a calf. And it's pretty neat, caribou, one thing that they have is both males and females retain um, grow antlers and then females that are pregnant retain them through the spring until they give birth. And so it's a really neat indication. So we, when we look at a female uh, caribou, if she has hard antlers, if she's still retaining antlers in June, and especially if she has an udder, she has a calf at heel, we can tell that, that she's given birth. So they give us plenty of clues. And then of course we can monitor deaths, um, where they're dying, uh, why they're dying. This picture is of me digging a collar out of some deep snow. Um, and without the aid of this collar, we would have had no idea where that caribou was, why it died or anything like that. And so that collar enabled us to go back and find that animal after it had died. Um, briefly regarding abundance, um, one of the things that those collars uh, allow us to do is we can find groups like this. So at certain times of the year, these caribou get together in aggregations and we can then go to those aggregations and photograph them and count them. And we would never be able to do that without the collar. So here's a, a really nice tight bunch of uh, caribou, I think in the Mulchatna herd. And here's a really nice tight and really, really big group of Western Arctic caribou. Uh, that group has well over 100,000 caribou in it that we were able to find with the radio collars um, and then photograph and then count. So I'm gonna uh, come out of my PowerPoint for a second here and show you a video. Um, this video is gonna show the movements through the course of a year for the four Arctic herds. So Western Arctic over here in this magenta color, uh, Teshikpuk in this sort of mustard color, Central Arctic in the pink, and Porcupine herd in this green. Okay, so starting in January 1st, it's gonna proceed throughout the year. So you can see these caribou, if you remember their herd ranges before, they're spread out all over um, sort of Northern Alaska there in Northern Canada. This is uh, coming out of spring now and caribou are starting to move a little bit. The migration's just starting to begin, especially for the animals that are farther away. And we come into April and May and they really go on the move and they're heading up toward where they're gonna calve. There's June 4th when sort of the peak calving across all those places is. They're all in these bunches where they're finding insect relief. And now they're beginning their summer migration, uh, spreading out all over the place to forage. And then the fall migration will start to begin. And then they'll slow down again as they enter the winter. And so this is a composite of multiple years and multiple collars, obviously. So there's a couple interesting things, I think, uh, about this. Um, So one of the things that we saw there is that they all kind of went their own way. They all, they all were kind of mixed together all over the place. And then they really bunched up at certain time of the year there in the summer. And that was one of the early things that people discovered was that uh, these caribou were repeating the use of certain areas to give birth. Uh, they were going back to those areas and having distinct ca calving grounds that had repeated use. And so that became one of the fundamental things that people discovered in the 60s and 70s about caribou. And so here's an example from a uh, uh, paper Matt Cameron published not too long ago. And this is just showing eight different years of calving distribution. And so this dark red area is basically the place that over the course of these years, uh, the caribou used every year for calving. And then you can see this kind of larger area. And so this was a big finding. Um, there was some traditional knowledge that knew about these calving grounds. There was a lot of effort that people would take to go up to those calving grounds and harvest calves for clothes. Um, but during the sort of modern era of, of biology, this was a big finding for people um, to understand that maybe these herds could be defined by where they calve. This is pretty interesting. They were really excited to find this kind of thing, right? That holy cow, all these caribou are right in here. Well. 
let me tell you about this area. This area is a little bit bigger than Connecticut and a little bit smaller than New Jersey. So basically the, the big excitement was those caribou were probably somewhere in an area the side of, size of New Jersey. Um, but back then that was a big deal. Um, people were really excited to find that out. So going back to this map of caribou herds, um, each of these herds then kind of has their own distinct calving ground and that what, that's what makes them kind of who they are as a distinct population. And uh, the bigger herds especially, more is known and about their particular calving grounds. There are some issues with using the calving grounds as how you define a herd. Uh, I'll give you an example. Here's all of North America. There's some collars, there's caribou herds in here that aren't shown, but here's some collar locations from all across North America. And you can see that over here, uh, the Leaf River and the George River are pretty well mixed in this place. Here's uh, the bath herds and Akiak herds. They're mixed up a little bit here. Uh, over in Alaska, where we tend to have a lot of collars, um, the porcupine and central Arctic are all mixed up. The Teshik puck in black and the central Arctic in yellow are mixed up. The Western Arctic and Teshik puck are mixed up. So there's mixing. There's a lot of mixing that goes on. So the herd concept really, you know, focuses on this calving ground idea, but really caribou are mixing all the time. We see that in distribution. Uh, we see it genetically too. Um, caribou are what's known as panmictic across all of this. The, like adjacent herds cannot really be differentiated from each other genetically. There's just too much mixing. Um, they spend a lot of time overlap during rut too. And so there's really, really very few times that they're very isolated, but those times are regular and distinct enough that it allows us to feel confident that a herd is a herd and that there's not a lot of interchange, although there is a little bit that goes on. Another thing I was gonna show you here is, uh, here's June 4th, which again is calving time across all this area. Um, and there are caribou way down here. They are not on that calving ground that I showed you. And they're caribou down here, and caribou over here, and some here, and some way over here. And uh, what those are, are young animals that aren't giving birth, or maybe older animals that aren't giving birth, and a lot of bulls. And so here's another part where the calving ground concept, you know, doesn't really work for everybody. If you're a bull, you might never really go to a calving ground because it doesn't have much to do with you after you're born. And so there are different parts of their lives that, uh, don't really tie really tightly to that cabin ground concept. But again, it still works pretty well. And, and I think people are happy to use it as a, as a defining uh, aspect of what makes a population a population. I was talking about bulls a little bit and how they weren't really with the rest of the herd during calving. And this picture shows kind of a neat aspect of caribou biology to me. So you have a, a calf here on the right and he's so short he can barely, you know, stay out of the bushes. This is probably his mom um, and she's walking along. She's obviously quite a bit bigger and quite a bit taller. And here's this bull, um, you know, he probably is not the father of that calf and probably has just joined them recently, but uh, caribou don't really stick together like that over long periods of time. But what you'll see about this bull is that he's twice as big as she is. Um, so that's another neat thing about caribou is that they're uh, sexually dimorphic. They're the most sexually dimorphic of all the deer. So if you take moose and black-tailed deer and white-tailed deer and all the other deer in the world, um, when you compare a male and a female, adult male and a female, um, in no of the other deer are they as different. Um, caribou bulls are quite a bit larger than caribou cows. And this leads to some pretty interesting things. Um, they tend to lead different, lead different lives. He's so much bigger that he can eat different kind of food than she can, you know. Um, she's got to eat kind of the best stuff, but he can eat more coarse forage, uh, forage that's a little bit less in nutrients, but his bigger gut allows him to retain that food for longer, digest it for longer, and get more out of it. You know, you imagine something going all the way up to a moose or a muskox that uh, has many, many hour digestion. Caribou are a bit, bit faster. Like I said, they're concentrate feeders, so they're eating the best and he's eating you know, a little bit worse than she is. Another kind of cool thing about this is to think about the different lives that they live in terms of the pressures on them. So her goal, whether she realizes it or not, is to live a long time and try to produce a lot of calves, hoping that at least some of them will survive to reproduce themselves. So her objective is a long life, you know, a long productive life. 
Well, his objective is a little bit different. Um, he needs to get big. He needs to get big soon because the longer he spends out on the landscape, the more chance he has to die for whatever reason. And so he's sort of in a race to get as big as he can and to reproduce as soon as he can. And so what that leads to is differences in behavior too. A cow tends to be a bit more careful. She tends to want to travel with other cows. Um, bulls are often more uh, independent. They might be by themselves. And a moment when he's got his head uh, deep in the food, uh, trying to put on as much weight as he can and not paying attention to what's around him, he's vulnerable to predation in a way that she might not have been. So it just really kind of shows um, the different lives that they live and the different pressures that are on them. They're both caribou, but they're kind of almost different animals, which I think is a pretty neat thing to think about. So after that little brief segue into bulls and cows, um, movement, uh, why move? Why migrate? Uh, what's the deal? Why would you want to do that? So whether we're looking at caribou or really any other animal that has migratory components to it. So if you have a species where you know, you have a duck, for example, that might live in one place, and then you have the migratory version of a duck. Um, generally speaking, the migratory version is much more abundant. Um, the reasons why, you know, are pretty complex, but I kind of point toward produce, precipitation, predators, and pestilence. So if you want to find really good food, you know, you got to move around and find it. Um, if, if you're just sitting in one place, you're never going to discover new things. And so they have to move, and again, if you're walking around with 250,000 of your best friends, um, this food's gonna get gone pretty quick and you're gonna have to find new food. So it's this sort of circularity. Yeah, you can find food, but you also have to find food because you're with so many other caribou now. Um, precipitation. Uh, if you can, and caribou are pretty neat in this respect, um, you should get away from things like deep snow and icing events. And They've shown a remarkable capacity to, as long as that happens sort of at the right time of the year when they're still mobile, um, they will get away from that. We had a movement in the Teshikpuk herd where there was an icing event on the North Slope, and they went hundreds and hundreds of miles to get away from that. Um, and of course, if you don't get away from it, you might suffer a fate like this calf here, who eventually starved in really, really difficult snow conditions. Um, you want to get away from predators, and of course, that's at multiple time scales. You know, you don't want to get eaten today, um, and then you probably want to drop your calves in a place that has fewer predators. And so this is one of these places where we can think about all the different ways that you can be a caribou. So for example, if you're a North Slope caribou, you might be getting away from lots of bears and wolves, and so now you really need to focus on finding good food, you know. If you're a Southern caribou, um, you might have more food and they are generally bigger caribou, um, but maybe you have to deal with a, a more diverse and more abundant predator array. So, you know, how they're dealing with these trade-offs of food, snow, and predation, you know, varies from herd to herd and even from individual to individual, I think. And then of course, pestilence. Um, obviously we saw those rapid movements in the middle of the summer and a lot of that has to do with getting away from bugs. And here's an estrid fly. Um, they lay an egg on the caribou, um, a larva, emerges and crawls inside that caribou and begins to pupate under the skin and uh, eventually will pop out and then become one of these again. And then of course there's the notorious mosquito that we're all familiar with um, that chases us as well. And so they're dealing with all these things at any given time and uh, they're moving and migrating trying to keep away from the bad things and find the good things. Um, that's the nature of their life essentially. And in order to live a life like that, um, especially if you're a big herd, you need a lot of space. Um, so here's the Western Arctic Range from 2012 to 2017. In the blue is the wintering areas that they were using during that period. In the green is summer range. Of course, here's that calving area up on the Utakak. And then some migratory areas that they use to go between summer and winter range. Um, in order to enable that lifestyle, they have to have a lot of land available to them. Um, here's an interesting thing though. If we look at this map and we were to look at the next five years, for example, from 2018 to 2021 or 22, it's gonna look different than this. You know, The last five years are not gonna be like the next five years. And so I'll give you an example of that, which is just another example of how they can be unpredictable. 
So I'm going to go through this kind of slowly because it's a little bit complicated. But uh, Jim Dow kind of came up with uh, these nine different wintering areas. Um, in the next slide I'm going to show, here's the three north slope areas, one, two, three, and they're all in blue. And here's kind of the middle of the range, the Kayakuk, the Central Brooks Range, and the Noatak, all in different shades of green. And then number four in yellow is going to be kind of the core of their range, the center of their range, the Kobuk, uh, the Selowick drainages, the Buckland drainages. And then in red and pink is going to be the Nolato Hills and the Seward Peninsula. And so um, there'll be a reminder on the next slide, but kind of that's what we're looking at here is from north to south is blue, green, yellow, and then shades of red and pink. So what this shows, this is pretty complicated, but what it shows is the percentage of collared Western Arctic caribou in any given year. So from 1991 through 2020. And so what we can see here is that in 91, a lot of caribou were using that yellow, the Kobuk, Squirrel, Selowick, and Buckland drainages. But pretty soon after, they really started to use the Nolato Hills, which is just at the base of the Seward Peninsula. And for a little while, this is predictably where you could find Western Arctic caribou in the winter. But before too long, that gradually started to fade. You know, during this year, 75% of all the callers were on the Nolato Hills. You enter this period of time where they're using the Brooks Range a little bit more, um, lots of, a little bit of the Seward Peninsula, a little bit of the Kobuk, and then you enter this period in the 2012 to kind of 2017 area where it switched to where the Seward Peninsula was the place to be. You know, again, 80% of the college could have been found on the Seward Peninsula in those years. And so that became the big area to use. And now, it's almost gone, you know, and in this year, there's no collars on the Seward Peninsula, and they've switched now to the Central Brooks Range. And so this is sort of another thing that led people to just be befuddled by these animals, you know, here today, gone tomorrow. And of course, you get used to this over the course of a decade that this is where the caribou are. And then suddenly they're not, they're somewhere else. And now they're here. And then what's happening next? Well, a betting person might put their money on the Central Brooks Range, but Maybe it'll be more like this era where it was all kind of mixed up for a little while. But the point being here is that these caribou needed to move across the landscape. And the reason why they needed to move across the landscape here is probably because they kind of ate themselves out of house and home. You know, again, during some of these periods, it wasn't 200,000 of your best friends, it was 500,000 of your best friends. And so they really were a presence on the landscape. And so they used it up and especially with their winter food of lichens, which doesn't regenerate very quickly, they have to go to somewhere new. Um, that's in contrast to the summer grounds where that's more of a grazing ecosystem and that food is gonna regenerate um, a little bit more rapidly. So this unpredictability I'm, I'm implying is a, a fundamental consequence of that movement. Um, you have to move, um, you can move, but that means that you have to move in a way. And so here's an example from the Teshikpuk herd. So Teshikpuk caribou calf right here around Teshikpuk Lake. And if you're a Teshikpuk caribou, you can kind of do different things if you want to. Um, they don't generally show that uh, decadal change like I showed with the Western Arctic herd, but they do show a lot of diversity. And so here, if you were here during calving and you had your insect relief here north of the lake, you might actually just choose to spend the whole year there. So this animal track in yellow, she basically spent her entire year kind of all around there. Um, some of these animals migrate a little bit. It's sort of just maybe a 80, 70, 80 mile migration over here, but they might choose to be over here. This animal in blue, probably following Western Arctic animals, ended up wintering over here on the no attack. And so um, that's another big option for them. They can take a long trip, you know, or they can stay at home. And so this herd displays a variety of migratory behaviors. And then this animal in this uh, teal color went and wintered on, down in the Anaktubic Pass area. And if you remember from some of those maps, uh, this is an area of big mixing, you know, um, Central Arctic caribou near here, Western Arctic caribou near here, Teshikpuk caribou near here. This is an area that isn't just for one herd. Lots of herds use this place, but a lot of them in any given year might be a, a Teshikpuk caribou. So, if you're a Teshikpuk caribou, you can choose to stay or you can choose to go. 
And what, that's what we see with this herd is that no individual animal seems to repeat the same behavior over and over. And we don't really understand why this is. And it probably has something to do with what's good for you that year. So you can imagine, for example, if you're a Tashik Puck caribou and, and you're in pretty good shape, you know, you and your calf are, are, are fairly fat and uh, you think maybe they, they could take a chance this year. They're gonna winter on the North Slope, which is a pretty tough place to winter but predation risk is probably gonna be really low. And in fact, when we've looked at uh, the chances that caribou starve versus die of predation, um, this is one place, this area where you often do actually see a bit of starvation death. In a lot of other places, I don't think they even have the opportunity to starve once they've gotten that weak. They're often uh, picked off by a predator. But may, let's say maybe you're in not as good a shape and you feel like, well, I need to make the trip and find better food and I can't risk uh, staying on the North Slope this year but I'm gonna to have to risk it with the predators. And we don't really know if that's true or not, but we do see a huge variety in individual behavior in this herd. You can move, you can not move, but the fact of the matter is you have the power to do so. You know, you are the most mobile, most efficient moving animal on land. And so it's always an option for you to try something new. That low energetic cost of travel um, lets you get away from bad weather. It lets you find new foraging opportunities um, and adapt to changing environments just by the hour, basically. So if you think about uh, prior to COVID, when Alaska Airlines would have these deals, right, they would send you an email that says, uh, hey, go to San Francisco for $99. Um, low cost travel led to unpredictable movements on the part of people. And I think it's really a similar pattern with those caribou, you know. You have the ability to move around. Um, the landscape and so you do and you can you take advantage of that to exploit new environments and get away from bad things another way that caribou are notoriously unpredictable is with populations and so here's a population graph of the western arctic herd here around 1970 there was almost 250,000, and very quickly they dropped to about 70,000, and slowly began this climb which really wasn't that slow in some respects. You know, some of these eras, they're increasing at 12% a year. And then they end up nearly 500,000. So they went from 70,000 to almost 500,000 in the course of, you know, not even 30 years. And then shortly thereafter began a slow decline, which became a much faster decline, which brings us to about where we are right now, about 245,000 caribou. So, these populations, which changes, which really befuddled uh, biologists early on, are still a thing that we struggle to understand and still uh, an iconic part of what makes them fascinating and unpredictable. So here's four different populations. Here's the Western Arctic again. So it went down and then it went up and then it went back down and maybe it's stable, maybe it's going back up again. Here's the Teshikpuk. Um, the red dots, again, are the minimum counts. It went up and then it went down and then it seems like it's going back up. Here's the porcupine herd. Went up, went down, really went up. Here's a much smaller herd, the Nushigak from the Nushigak Peninsula. Um, went up pretty slowly, maybe went down a little bit slowly. And so this starts to beg a question, um, the caribou cycle, right? This is pretty attractive to look at and say, okay, so they go down and then they go up and then they go down and then I think they're gonna go up again and maybe it's a 30 to 40 year period. Um, when you look at the porcupine herd, they went up and then they went way up, you know, and the period between those ups and downs was a little bit different than the Western Arctic herd. And of course the magnitude was different, you know. Um, so that makes me ask a question do caribou really cycle? You know, is there a predictable amplitude? Is there a predictable period? And maybe it's being a little bit fussy, but uh, when I think of a cycle, I think of something that goes up and down at a regular rate, and the lows are the lows and the highs are the highs, and it kind of goes up and down. And of course, this is nature, and so maybe we can't expect things to be uh, that regular, but really, whether we call it a cycle or not, they're clearly having these rapid changes in abundance. And so, What's driving those? And now we're gonna get into a little bit more of a hypothesis than, than um, established fact or principle. So I created a little population for this uh, presentation. I call it Espen's herd and it has stable rates. So 
calves in this population survive at 50%. So if you're born, you have a 50% chance of surviving. From age two to 10, you have an 85% chance of surviving, which is a pretty common survival rate for Arctic caribou. And then when you get old, 11 to 20 for a caribou, um, let's say you're only gonna survive at 50% rate. So these rates are plenty enough to make this herd grow. So over a 30 year period, it's just gonna continue to grow with a little bit of, you know, uh, up and down and uncertainty based on uh, just random chances in there. So now I'm gonna change this population. So that population now has the same adult survival rates. So the young, the prime aged adults will survive at 85% and the old ones survive at 50%. And the calves now, starting in this year, are gonna survive at 50%, but every single year, that survival rate's gonna drop on average. So now they're gonna survive at 49%, 48%, 47%, and so on. That 1% change per year is all it takes to make this population have this shape, to go up and then finally it catches up to them and goes down. So I just show this to demonstrate how little it takes for that dynamic nature to kind of exist in that population, just a 1% drop per year. So now we drop for 1% per year and then we're gonna switch right back to 50% and then boom, off we go and we're increasing rapidly again. Now, is that real? Have I created anything that's at all resembling real life? Well, one of the surveys we do, especially on the Teshikpuk and Western Arctic is we go out in the spring and we go and visit a group of caribou and we try to figure out what proportion of those caribou are made up of calves. And so we'll use those collars to inform our sampling effort and we'll visit 100 or 200 caribou around each of those collars and then basically count how many of them are calves, what proportion of them are calves. And so we end up with a proportion of the population that's calves after each of these surveys. And that's what this is. This is those numbers over a 25 year period. Um, we started off at 20% of the population being short yearlings and gradually went down to something like 10% of the population being short yearlings. And so here's real life, right? It's not a neat line. It bounces around every year. There's a lot of uncertainty, um, but the product of that slow change results in this now. During a huge proportion of that time, they increased and increased and increased and increased, and then finally it caught up to them. That slow change in the number of young animals that were surviving to be almost a year old caught up to them. And so what's probably going in in that population, and this is the thing we really struggle to understand and what makes it more theory than established principle is, if that's happening to you, if every single year you're having fewer and fewer and fewer calves that make it to adulthood and you have fairly stable adult survival, eventually 10, 15, 20, 25 years down the line, your population is composed of a lot of old animals and they're not gonna live forever. Um, and finally, something happens. Um, maybe it's a really long winter, you know, late spring. Maybe it's some really bad winter weather that happened to them over the course of the winter. Maybe they had a really hot summer followed by a pretty tough winter. And that's kind of all it maybe takes to have all those older animals drop out of your population. And that's what we think we might be seeing. And in some ways is maybe the next frontier of us understanding what drives these populations. Um, have we solved it? Oh, no, not at all. You know, I mean, obviously to set that story up, I had to kind of create a fake population that changed in a fairly stable way that I think represents what might be happening in real life. But even then, even if we say that it's actually the slow change and reduction in the number of young animals that are surviving, we still don't really know why that's happening. You know, is it because there are too many caribou on the landscape and you have these incremental changes in how many calves survive for whatever reason, whether it's because now that population supports, you know, a bigger predator population or they have less to eat because they're sharing it with more caribou or there's been so many caribou on the landscape that they've eaten all the lichen over the last few decades. So we don't really understand what might be even driving that slow change in the reduction of calves that survive. And so, 
maybe a more poetic way to say, you know, that this is the 39th year of uh, unpredictable caribou movements is a, a Chippewa and proverb that says that nobody knows the ways of the wind or the caribou. And maybe we've come a long way. Um, maybe we've learned a lot about caribou movements and what might be driving these caribou. But to this day, for me personally, and I think for a lot of us that work on these caribou, and a lot of us that care about them and, and you know, wonder about them, um, they still remain an incredibly mysterious animal that, that's very, very fun to study and always um, has a bit of driving you crazy sometimes, but still is a, a wonderful and interesting thing to study. Um, that is the extent of my talk now. And so I think now maybe Heather has a few things to bring up and then I think we can move into questions. Hey Lincoln, I think we'll just move straight into the questions and answers if that's okay with you. And sure. we have one in the chat box, but if you have other questions out there, uh, make sure to put them in the chat box um, and we could ask them to Lincoln why he's here. So one of the questions that came in was, um, what are your thoughts on caribou movement and um, Sorry, what is your thought different types of antlers and caribou? Why are there different types of antlers and caribou antlers on ADAC are very different than their um, ancestors on GMU 13, now China area. Well, you know, that's partly why I preface this with here's where my knowledge comes from. You know, I know a little bit about those caribou and I would have to speculate that really probably the reason why they're quite different is that they were bottlenecked essentially. There's a principle where um, if you just take a few animals to start a new population, those animals are only gonna have a certain set of genetic variation. And so maybe the animals that moved to ADAC just didn't have the genes that it took to grow the kind of antlers that you tend to see on average in the Nelchina herd. Um, you know, the nutrition on those animals was incredible. They're very, very large animals, but yeah, like you say, their antler, uh, antlers don't tend to be that impressive, um, especially when you know where they came from, you know the population that they came from. So I would have to speculate that it's probably the fact that they went through a, a bit of a genetic bottleneck and just didn't have the genes in, in the, the starting founding population that had uh, really good antler growth. Okay, and we have a similar one coming in about um, how many years of an average does it take an average bull to reach full size or maturity? So I think for when we mark caribou, um, when we mark bull caribou, we mark caribou that we perceive to be almost mature. So we want them to live quite a while and um, we want them to have that collar for a little while because like I was suggesting, the pressures on them are tremendous. You know, they're trying to eat, they're trying to get big and they're taking a lot of risk to do that. And then if they do in fact breed, um, we have a lot of animals that die right after the rut, whether that's because they've just completely exhausted themselves or they've made themselves vulnerable to predation or they've had an injury. And so I think for most animals, and it's gonna vary, you know, I think most animals probably enter that breeding stage by the time that they're four or five years old. You know, that's when we tend to perceive them as a mature bull, but whether or not they're actually a breeding bull or not, I don't think we really understand very well. I think there would need to be a lot of work to understand um, the genetic output of, of the caribou that are out in the landscape. Okay. I do know from experience, the caribou that we work with, um, they tend to die when they, the male caribou tend to die by the time they're six or seven in many, many cases. And so um, it would seem to be that that's the window for them. You know, four to six or seven is probably when it's all happening for them. Okay. And then we have a couple of questions coming in about um, specific herds. And so we do hope to answer these questions with herd specific updates um, similar to this presentation following our current caribou series. So we're going to hold off on those for right now. Um, but we will be following after this, the next two series of this, I'm um, hopefully giving an opportunity for our area biologists or caribou researchers in that area to answer those questions for you. Um, our next question, what, um, or how do you calculate what the ideal harvest is each year and what matrix do you look at to determine the ideal size of the herd? <laughs> wonder who asked that question. Um, you know, an interesting thing about caribou um, is that we struggle a little bit with that. You know, um, 
in a moose population or a muskox population, change isn't happening that rapidly. And so um, you can do some modeling, you can try to figure things out, but in a lot of wildlife management, a lot of what we do is trial and error. We try something and see what happens. And so, you know, you try a harvest rate on a moose population and the bull cow mm -hmm. ratio changes and the abundance changes and you kind of react to that. Um, same thing with some of these other animals. With these caribou, they're changing so fast on their own that it makes it pretty hard for us to really understand uh, what's viable and what's not. Now, what do we see? Um, across the landscape, we see harvest rates of two or three percent on some of the smaller herds that maybe are less dynamic. On the bigger herds, sometimes we get as close to 10 percent, particularly if we're hoping to reduce them in size. And so um, when you're trying to understand what the optimal uh, harvest rate is, you're trying to understand what is their innate growth potential at that time, um, where are they headed and how big are they right now? And then of course, what is the composition of that harvest? You know, um, is it gonna be bulls? Is it gonna be cows? The more bulls that you harvest, usually that means that you can harvest a higher proportion of the population, but um, that'll eventually, you'll run out of steam there too and change that bull cow ratio. So it's a pretty dynamic situation and in experience, it seems to vary from anywhere from two to 10% with a lot that seem to hover around the three to six range. Okay, so I got one, Heather, if you want. Perfect. Thank you, Mike. Um, yeah, Lincoln, maybe without, you may not want to go into detail about this, but is there any research on uh, that you could point someone towards uh, movement of caribou on new gravel roadways in Northwest Alaska? Well, so a lot of the work on caribou and roads has been done um, in the Central Arctic and the oil fields. Um, so there's a lot of work there. A lot of that's focused on the summer, which is when they happen to be in there. Um, so there's a pretty big body of research and some very recent stuff that's looked at movements through the oil fields. So some of the things that we know is that calving caribou in general, um, those cows are gonna avoid some of that infrastructure and activity, particularly when those calves are young. So generally speaking for two to three kilometers around uh, some of that infrastructure, they're going to avoid it. You know, it's not necessarily that it's gravel, but that there's movement and that there's activity and pipelines and things like that. And then beyond that, they begin to move through the oil fields. Um, they tend to avoid some of the oldest stuff. Uh, for example, there's pipelines that are maybe only three feet off the ground and lo and behold, a three foot pipeline is actually a fence. Um, but some of the newer construction that's five to seven feet high, they tend to move through fairly well. So there's a lot of research in the summer and much less research uh, on what happens in the fall. Um, definitely we have seen caribou encounter roads um, and have difficulty crossing them at times. And so I think it, it's gonna be a big part of what we research in the future. There's new oil fields uh, on the North Slope that present opportunities, um, new roads up there that present opportunities to understand how the caribou are interacting at different seasons other than the summer. So it's going to be an active front of research in the near future. Okay, so Lincoln, we're going to take a pause really quick because it's just about eight o'clock. So I want to let people go if they want to, but we'll keep this open for question and answers. Um, well, we wanted to remind everyone, well, first off, thank you for joining us. And then I uh, wanted to remind you guys that we have some upcoming presentations and additional resources that we have available. Um, Lincoln, would you mind advancing your slide? <laughs> oh. Okay, so some of the um, additional information we have on um, herd specific, um, specific areas are our newsletters, and we have them for most or a few of the herds throughout Alaska, and they're available on our website at Alaska or adfg.alaska.gov. And then we also have some pamphlets and brochures that you could have if you have a local area office in your area that you come to and collect, or those are also available online. And our website on the caribou species themselves has a lot of additional information and it points you in a direction for other resources to um, further looking into publications and research and management that's currently going on. And we're also excited to announce that our next top talk is taking place on Wednesday, March 31st at 7 p.m. And it's gonna be um, looking at how we count caribou in Alaska and how Fish and Game has done it over time and the advancement of technology. And we have two of our staff that will be joining us to watch 
how a uh, recent video on counting caribou and then be available for questions and answers too. So we appreciate your guys' time and we'll stay on here for um, some more questions. And I also, um, we just put the link into the chat box. So if you'd like to register for that, you'll get an email reminder of that next talk coming up next week. Okay, and there are some polls. We'd love to hear from you um, about what you would like to um, have us present next. And so if you have a moment before you head out, um, would you please participate in the poll? And we'll also keep, um, link it on the line for a little bit to do some more question and answers. But for those of you who are heading out, thank you again for joining us. And we really appreciate your time this evening. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so I think we still have some questions out there and participants out there. So, Mike. Yeah, you want me to ask one, Heather? Yeah, and you could also introduce yourself too if you'd oh, okay. like to. And yeah, it's great to have these questions coming in. So I think Mike and I will just take turns asking them if that works well for you, Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. um, got one here. Are there any descendants left of the reindeer brought to Alaska in about 1898 from Norway? Did they escape and join with the wild caribou herds? So um, there are still a few active reindeer herds on the Seward Peninsula, not very many. Um, one of the consequences, uh, if you remember that figure that showed those caribou gradually moving off the Nulato Hills onto the Seward Peninsula, what that meant is that they just kind of walked into those reindeer herding areas and tended to um, collect them basically. And once those caribou moved off, the reindeer moved with them. Um, and so for years when that was really happening, people would see reindeer uh, when they were out looking at caribou. Um, they were kind of the obvious reindeer, piebald, um, really unique um, peelage or antlers. And so people were seeing that for a while. They were seeing ear tags because um, that was right after people were still handling them and things like that and ear tagging and notching them. So definitely they went out there. Um, are they still out there? Um, I think they really struggle to keep up with caribou. You know, they're short-legged, they are built differently, and they, they struggle. Now, the consequence of them being there is still out there. And so when people have done genetic sampling on these caribou herds, on the North Slope especially, those genes are still present in those populations at pretty low rates. Um, every once in a while, they would see like a 50-50. You know, you can see that genetic uh, code that's unique to uh, Eurasian reindeer basically. But I don't know that anybody's done that recently and so it would be interesting to see if they're really still present in the population and if those genes still persist or whether or not they've gradually been weeded out because they could not keep up with the caribou. Okay this is a question that's similar um, with to follow up that one is about how many caribou subspecies are there in the world? Mm. Yeah, I'm going to revert back to my slide. I'm an Alaskan caribou uh, specialist, if you can even call me that. And so I really don't know. I mean, there's, you know, um, going to be the Eurasian example, um, woodland caribou. I think over in Canada, there's at least two other subspecies, but I cannot speak with any, you know, real confidence about that. That's not what I'm an expert in by any means. <clears throat> okay, I got a good one for you, Lincoln. Related to your four P's, your own self-designated impacts on caribou. Have any herd population changes over the years been subject to multivariate analysis using your four P's, um, produce, pest, pestilence, and predators, yeah. such that those factors themselves have an impact uh, on population? I don't know of anybody that would have or has ever had the data set yeah. that could basically bring together the abundance of bears, the abundance of golden eagles, the abundance of wolverines, the abundance of wolves, um, changes in, you know, like an abundance, uh, changes in weather. I mean, one of the problems, again, as I referred to, is that caribou are really hard to tie to their landscape, and nobody has ever brought all those things in all at once. And so, again, that's one of the things we can speculate about all those things and their relative impact their relative impact on one herd versus another. You know, we, we, we think they matter, we think they all matter, but has anybody ever put that together in a single analysis? Not effectively, no. Okay, okay so we have a question coming in. Um, I'll put two together. This one is, 
On areas of slope is heavily grazed, how long does it take for vegetation to recover? And how much do caribou eat in a day? Or what are they eating? Oh, so let me start with the recovery part. So um, depending upon the environment and sort of what, you know, where, where on Alaska it is, you know, um, people generally seem to think that that lichen base will take 20 to 30 to 40 to 50 years to recover. So if you were to burn it, for example, in a forest fire and take it down to zero, you know, it might be 50 years before it recovers to that abundance. Now, some of these other species, um, it's hard for us to tell that caribou have even been there. <laughs> um, there's a few exclosures and things like that, but the plants that regenerate, um, I, it's not obvious, for example, that they've gone through. Um, they've grazed it and moved on. Um, so some of the vascular plants, the sedges and the, and the willows and things like that, um, it's not really clear that they're having that big an, of an impact. In other places in North America, they think that they've seen that. They think that they've seen heavy enough browsing on especially uh, some of the willows and dwarf birch uh, that they eat um, farther east. But uh, that kind of stuff tends to generate, regenerate fairly quickly. Um, by the next year, it's likely to be back to where it was um, if it's a vascular plant and it hasn't been really, really heavily grazed. And, and I don't think they generally do that. They would have to be stuck somewhere to graze it that hard. They would just as soon move on. How much do they eat? Um, there was some work that Bob White did uh, on the North Slope actually, where he basically looked at how much food needed to be on the landscape for them to have so much to eat that the food was not a limiting factor. And it really wasn't very much. If I remember correctly, it was something like 100 grams per meter squared, which isn't a lot of food, you know? And so they're consuming that pretty darn quickly. Um, and over the course of the day, I think it varies a lot. Um, if they're under that insect relief time, they might not be eating as much as they want to. They may be spending way too much time, you know, uh, running around instead of eating. And then when that weather finally decreases, um, it may allow them to totally explore forage. And, and I've seen this um, as they're retreating from the coast uh, after really hot weather. I mean, they are just shoveling that food into their mouth. So I can imagine that at that time of year, um, it wouldn't surprise me if it was approaching like two kilograms of forage or something like that. We've seen that in weight gain, for example. Uh, yearling caribou that are not lactating, so they don't have the, the expense of milk production. Um, They're just trying to grow their own bodies. Um, they can have a daily weight gain that can exceed a kilogram a day. So clearly for them to be putting on that much weight, they're eating a lot more than that. Okay, uh, Lincoln, have you observed any effects of climate change on the Arctic caribou herds? No, I can't say that we can tie that really directly together. I mean, I think that's something that people are concerned about. Um, you know, when you look forward, uh, you know, 50, 100 years at what people project different climates to be, um, there are potentially some changes that could have serious consequences for caribou. Um, if there's a lot more snow, that could be bad in some areas. If the weather's a lot warmer and the bugs are worse, um, that could be pretty bad. Um, there also could be some positives, you know. Um, caribou, especially in the winter and in the summer, tend to benefit from wind, and some projections predict more wind. Uh, one of the things that we may be seeing with the Teshikpuk herd, for example, they're the, our farthest north herd, and they could actually be benefiting from milder climates. You know, maybe they are so extreme right now that they're benefiting from it. And it's really the southern herds that maybe could struggle in the future. But as far as anybody really tying that definitively to um, changes in productivity or survival, um, nobody's really done that quite yet. Okay, and then this question comes in asking about um, past work. So um, is there an area or somewhere that the public can look at um, like John Trent's work or other previous biologists and what, where would they find those resources? So Fish and Game has a library that just, it's incredible actually. Um, it has all sorts of uh, published papers, you know, peer reviewed papers. It has reports going back to statehood. Um, all kinds of things. So if, if somebody wants to go and dig into the older stuff, and we've been doing that recently a little bit ourselves, um, you know, the people that are kind of working these days, uh, they weren't there in the 70s and 80s. And so there's kind of a lot for them to learn by going back and, and looking at that uh, research. So the 
fish and game library online is an amazing resource for that kind of stuff. <clears throat> okay, and we just put that link into the chat box too, so if you're interested. Um, it's the Wildlife Pub Publications at Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Okay, um, here's one. I might, I'll give you a break on this one, Lincoln. Um, where would I find out about movements of caribou in a particular area like G Game Management Unit 19C? And I, I would say for the whole statewide, um, you would want to contact your local, whatever the closest fish and game office is there and try to talk to somebody at the front or ask them to put you in touch with the uh, caribou researcher in that area is your best bet. Heather? Yeah, I'm catching up on questions. Okay. Let's see. Um, Craig George has a question. Why are there thousands of caribou wintering around uh, and occasionally within Uktiavik? Why are there caribou wintering? Because you invited them, Craig. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, it's interesting, you know, um, I don't know if you noticed on that Western Arctic map, and if I were to show one from Teshikbuk, um, it's kind of interesting that the 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 quantitative estimates of range, dis range distribution don't actually include barrel. Um, caribou don't visit that area that often, although they're quite far south, you know. And so maybe one thing that's happened is that over the course of the years, you know, these caribou are starting to realize here's a place that hasn't really been very heavily exploited, you know. I, I wonder that myself, you know. Um, I also wonder if, you know, um, for many years, maybe the activity around Barrow was enough to kind of keep them away. And uh, the draw is strong enough now for some individuals to kind of want to deal with that. But um, I don't know, Craig. Um, yeah, they're always moving, man. They're, they got to find a new place to go. Good answer, Link. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, here is another one. Is there a tipping point that you can correlate to population drop or rise? You know, I think, you know, that goes back to some of those graphs that I made that are kind of speculative, you know. Um, I think the proximal tipping point, like I said, often is a big natural event, you know. Um, you, you know, a, a rough summer, a hot summer, followed by a difficult winter or a really, really long spring. I mean, we saw that all across Alaska one year where spring was delayed by a month. And, you know, as adapted to the Arctic as these animals are, winter is long and they want it to be over, you know. And if you give them an extra month of winter, I think that's hard on everything, whether you're a moose or a sheep or a caribou. And so a lot of times that's sort of the proximal tipping point, you know. But we don't really, you know, in an event like that, that was widespread across the state, it's fairly easy to, to feel confident in that speculation. During the Western Arctic's decline, when they were rapidly declining, we thought that it was probably some really bad icing events that precipitated uh, at least some of the declines in some of the areas. But again, these caribou are living on such a large uh, landscape. It, it has been hard sometimes to really try to tie those mortality events with you know specific weather events. It can be challenging at times, but often I think it's that combined with you know, maybe this, you know, building age structure issue um, that may be a factor in what causes caribou to decline rapidly when it does happen. Okay, and we have one last question, I think, on the chat box. And did you write a book about your studies in Arctic caribou? <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, uh, like I mentioned, I spent the weekend with Patrick uh, Valkenberg, who was yeah. a longtime fish and game biologist. And uh, that's what he's doing right yeah. now. He's writing a book right now about all his experiences. And so if I ever did, I think it's a long time in the future. Okay, we still have a lot of people on. Um, I don't think we have any new questions here. So if anybody wants to throw something out, now will be the time or we'll probably wrap things up. I don't know if Lincoln's been keeping up with the chat box coming in, but there's been a lot of thank yous and a lot of appreciation for your time tonight. So we want to tell you thank you and um, take your time here with us. It was very enjoyable and informative. You want to say thank you? Thank you. You're welcome. It's good to see you. Hello. And thank you. <laughs> 
Thank, thanks, Lincoln. Yeah. Thanks, Lincoln. Thank you, guys. Thanks all for coming. It was a wonderful turnout. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. And we hope that we will see you again um, for Thanks our next week. talk next week. <laughs>